You know, Suikoden fans outside of Japan were pretty lucky when considering the amount of games in the series that actually made its way to international shores. All five main entries were given proper English releases abroad, and only a few spin-off games were passed on for localization. At the very least, you can say that Konami treated fans of the Suikoden series a lot better than those of another one of its big gaming franchises, Ganbare Goemon, which only saw, what, four and a half games picked up for overseas markets from a library spanning over 20 titles? A damn shame. And for the most part, the Tsukuna games that never got published outside of Japan are very accessible to the rest of the world, as both PlayStation 1 Suiko Gaiden games as well as card stories for the Game Boy Advance had unofficial English translation patches put out online by dedicated fans. And while the final Suikoden game, The Woven Web of a Century for the PSP, never received such treatment, you can watch my nearly one hour long video covering the game and get a pretty good feel for what it's all about. I suppose that's no real consolation, but hey, it's better than nothing. So between the officially published games, the fan translations, and an amateurish look at the one Tsukuden game that most fans probably won't ever have a chance to play for themselves, the series is covered, right? Well, not exactly. When it first came out in late 1995 in Japan, the original Tsukuden immediately won over the hearts of RPG enthusiasts in the 32-bit era and it's arguable that it was the first really great role-playing game on the Sony PlayStation. The following year, Konami released the game in North American and PAL regions, and while it never quite attained the popularity it enjoyed in its home country, it did manage to secure itself a small but devoted fanbase. The original Japanese game had some gorgeous package design, and an amazing full-color manual that featured many story bits and details, as well as some fantastic artwork of the characters, items, and runes found in the lands of the Scarlet Moon Empire. The US version of the game I grew up with had almost none of these extra goodies housed in the pages of its bland, black and white player manual. Additionally, Konami went the route so many other publishers did at the time when handling JRPGs and, well, Japanese games in general, and replaced Suikoden's iconic box art with something the PR team thought would more likely appeal to Western gamers. While it might just be because of nostalgia, I can't say I dislike this cover, but I will say it's a major downgrade from the original. I always wondered who these people were supposed to be, and I think I've got it all figured out. This suave fellow over here has got to be the main protagonist, Tyr McDole. Since he's got his Chinese style garb and a fighting bow, albeit a metallic one, I would guess that this woman is Leknot, though she doesn't seem to suffer from the same visual impairment that the blind seer does. Wait, is Leknot actually blind? Whatever. Here's a random monster from the game that's on the cover probably only because he looks cool. This evil looking lady is most definitely the court magician Windy, the sister to Leknot. And this haggard old man is Emperor Barbarossa clutching onto his Dragon King sword. The sovereign rune on that sword protects him from any form of magic, in case you didn't know. That leaves this guy right here, who I thought might have been Teal McDole, since he's on the side of the Emperor and has a cape. But that wouldn't make much sense, since he looks younger than his son Tyr. I also thought it could be Ted, due to the bow and arrow, but if you look at Tehran Castle in the middle of the image, there's a dude wearing the same outfit riding around on a dragon, so that must mean he's actually Futch, the young dragon knight. But Futch doesn't use a bow and arrow for his weapon, so how could that be? He's also not an Adonis. Well, at least not at this point in the Suikoden story. Ah, uh, whatever, I'm looking into this way too much. And whoever produced this art was probably just in it for the potch. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. Whether it was because of the series' huge popularity in Japan, or Konami trying to get another fistful of yen, Suikoden 1 would eventually find its way to three other gaming platforms, with each port bringing along unique changes for the PlayStation original. These ports also never saw the light of day in the West, so many Suikoden fans don't know much about them, which is why for my next contributions in the summer of Tsukuren, I decided I'd talk about these adaptations and explore what sets them apart from the PS1 original, and starting with the Sega Saturn port, determine which of the four is the ideal version of Konami's classic RPG. 
I love Konami's games, and many of their offerings on the Sony PlayStation in particular are among my all-time favorites, such as Vandal Hearts, Akumajo Dracula X Nocturne in the Moonlight, aka Castlevania Symphony of the Night, and of course, Genso Suikoden. In most regions, these three games were PS1 exclusives, but in Japan, each would also be ported to the Sega Saturn, which meant altering the titles to run on the platform. The PlayStation and Saturn had very different hardware architecture, each with their own set of distinct strengths and weaknesses, and porting over titles from one to the other often resulted in less than stellar results. Take Symphony of the Night for example. It suffered from persistent slowdown, scaled down graphical effects, and longer load times. But perhaps in an effort to make up for this, Konami Computer Entertainment Nagoya, the team in charge of the Saturn conversion, included some really cool additional content exclusive to Sega's version of the game. Brand new areas to explore in Dracula's castle, some neat new items, and the ability to play as fan favorite Maria Renard are among the most noteworthy additions, giving this version a director's cut kind of feel to it. The Saturn port of Genso Sukuren was handled by a different team, Casey Sapporo, but they followed in the footsteps of the Castlevania team and also created a sort of director's cut with their effort. Aside from differences due to the shift in hardware, there are a lot of changes made for artistic reasons as well as newly added scenarios and gameplay features. From here on out, I'll explore what sets the Saturn version of Suikoden apart from the original, and I won't be analyzing the core game in any depth like I usually do, so if you haven't played the PS1 version before, you probably won't get much out of this video. I strongly suggest you play the game if you haven't, it's really great. But if you don't have the time or just need to brush up a bit on your Suikoden know-how, I would recommend watching Super Derek's Suikoden Review as an appetizer, or Game Dave's Suikoden Retrospective if you're hungry and want the full course. Oh, and spoiler warning, duh. Alright everybody, let's go. Genso Suikoden for the Saturn was released in Japan on September 17th, 1998, three years after its original debut, and just two months before Genso Suikoden 2 would be published on the PS1. Booting up the game for the very first time, you'll encounter the first of many changes made to this version, which is a completely redone, alternate intro movie. It features brand new artwork and is done in a style very much like the intro found in its sequel. This new opening is really well done and gives an epic sense of scope to the adventure that is about to take place. It's more well crafted than the original, though I'm not sure which I like more. Must be that nostalgia clouding my judgement again. I'll play the Saturn intro movie in its entirety a little later in this video and you can decide which is better for yourself. Other artistic changes in this port are small, and a majority will probably only be noticed by the most hardcore of Suikoden fans. During my complete playthrough, I was able to find the following changes. Character reflections in Gregminster Palace have been squished a bit. Character portraits have been redrawn and look a lot smoother and less pixelated now, and also no longer shift positions and flip during dialogue. The gray spinning circle that appears under highlighted characters and enemies in battle has been replaced with a color wheel. The scene where Tio bids his son farewell in the night is no longer monochromatic. Treasure chests are now blue in the beginning parts of the game, and later become a rusty copper color closer to those found in the PS1 version. The illuminated stained glass design in Leknot's astrological tower on Magician's Isle is much more defined. Consuming the poisonous robber's tea on Mount Tiger Wolf will turn the victim's skin blue. Animated flames are now present in the background when discovering the village of the elves has been set ablaze, and the Suko map displays locations as large blue squares rather than small white ones. At the end of the game, the escape scene is cut short, the red filter is absent, and everything plays out automatically for the most part which means you won't have awkward enemy encounters during the dramatic finale. And finally, the post credits ending image has been changed completely, from the photo-esque one in the original to a full-size illustration. These artistic changes are few and far between, and obviously don't affect the game in any big way. However, the same cannot be said for many of the changes made due to the hardware limitations of the Sega Saturn, which can drastically alter the player's game experience. The least significant of these is that the cute, iconic loading splash screens in the PS1 version that depicted characters like Sarah washing clothing or Mina dancing have been cut out completely, perhaps because of how the Saturn loads data. Any sort of transparency effects are heavily modified or removed due to the system's difficulty in rendering such graphics. Text boxes and menus are now solidly colored, 
as well as certain enemies, like the ghosts in Necklord's castle. Other transparencies from the original have been converted into a sort of cross-hatched pixelated style, the most glaring examples of which are character shadows in battles, or water and light in towns. The fluffy clouds in the foreground when riding on the dragon black are absent, and the titles of the large-scale army battles just kind of dissolve away pixel by pixel. The individual character endings don't fade in and out like in the PS1 version, and instead slide from side to side, and the text effects in the credits have been altered to exclude any transparencies. The graphics used for rune and magic attacks in battles have been completely overhauled to work with the Saturn's inferior 3D capabilities over the PlayStation. Some of these effects don't look too bad, and in the case of the Soul Eater, reduce the time it takes for spells to complete, which can be a welcome change. But others look pretty bad, and sometimes drag on longer than they used to on the PS1. The magic attack used during the army skirmishes has been altered as well, though it seems like the same effect could have been implemented just fine. One of my favorite parts of the battle system in the original Suikoden was its dynamic camera system, and there was a genuine feeling of excitement generated by the extreme, pixelated close-ups of characters performing critical hits. Sadly, the camera is more subdued in the Saturn version, and scoring a critical barely zooms the camera in at all. While the polygonal backgrounds used for battles didn't break any new ground in the world of 3D graphics back in 1995, I guess it goes without saying that these two saw a downgrade in the Saturn port, which have less definition and grainier textures. Outside of combat, certain graphical effects have also been altered, such as when the Soul Eater is used during a story segment. For some reason, the teleportation animations no longer appear in the game, and characters who do teleport just kind of show up suddenly. However, this effect was strangely replaced by a bolt of lightning in a few early instances. This change is even stranger because near the end of the game, as Wendy attempts to take the Soul Eater from young Master McDole, the bolts of lightning that accompany the souls of those trapped within the room that ward her off have been removed. There are other odd omissions in the Saturn Suikoden, such as the lack of animation for the rapids on the world map, and it's hard for me to believe these came about due to a lack of juice from the system. Maybe someone just forgot to work on these parts, or maybe it was just laziness. Who knows? Whether done for artistic or hardware compatibility reasons, the differences in the Saturn Sukuden I've talked about up until this point have only been aesthetic, not affecting the game in any real meaningful way, especially for first time players. However, there are other differences that modify the player experience in a big way, and not positively, and these exist solely due to the jump from the PlayStation to the Saturn. I'd say the biggest offender is the frequent load times that break the flow of the game. In the original release of Suikoden, there were barely any load times, and everything moved along at a fast, smooth pace. Exploring towns and dungeons, getting in and out of battles, it was all pretty seamless. 
Unfortunately, in the Saturn version, no matter what you do or where you go, your patience will be tested as you wait for the game to load. In places that allow for random enemy encounters, you have to wait about 5 seconds or so before every battle begins. And while the encounter rates aren't overly excessive in Sukuren, the constant waiting game of staring at a black screen before combat begins will definitely make each fight feel like it drags on longer than it actually does. Even wrapping up a battle takes up more time than in the original, since you can no longer hold the confirm button down and zoom past each character's EXP gains, and instead you must press the button for each individual character to get through the victory fanfare. For battles, there are a few graphical hiccups and bouts of slowdown, usually when the screen is crowded, there are large character sprites, or when spells are used, but it's not too bad. Well, outside of the final boss fight, anyway. In towns and in dungeons, entering buildings, rooms, and just moving between screens also requires the game to load for a short period of time, and as it loads, the music will stop playing, breaking the flow even more. Well, at least the BGM doesn't start over from the beginning when this happens, so it could have been worse. Regarding other audio issues, there are a few sound effect mix-ups here and there during battles that are more amusing than irritating. <laughs> and sometimes the music will cut out during cutscenes, which did happen here and there in the PlayStation version, though it seems to occur more often in this port. Once in a while the BGM will glitch out and audio levels will change sporadically, killing the eardrums of any within the television's immediate vicinity. Though my disc is in very good shape, I'm not completely certain if the problem stems from programming or physical media. The quality of the game's amazing soundtrack has been preserved for the most part, though the world map and headquarters themes have been changed to inferior MIDI versions of the originals. Have a listen for yourself. I'm sure by now you're wondering why anyone would play this port over the original if they had a choice, as a few meaningless aesthetic changes, a downgraded gameplay experience, and a redone introduction movie don't exactly make for a compelling reason for newcomers or seasoned fans of the series to try out Sukuden on the Saturn. Well, as I mentioned earlier, this version also introduces some brand new content to the game, which is advertised on the spine card. First off is a new scenario involving the Pirate's Fortress. In the original game, bringing over Taiho and Yamku and speaking with the pirate leader Anji led to a fight, and upon victory, the three pirates joined the Liberation Army, and that was that. However, in the Saturn game, speaking to Anji and getting brushed off will trigger an event where the pirates randomly kidnap two female stars of destiny, and you'll either have to confront them in battle or pay a heavy 500,000 pot ransom to get your allies back. There are some funny bits of dialogue between the pirates and their victims, such as Latte only being concerned with finding her cat Mina, and offering to join the pirates if they fetch the feline for her, the traitor, and Esmeralda just complaining about the state of the swashbuckler's abode and inquiring about tea time, 
making her kidnappers question just exactly what kind of operation the Liberation Army runs with these kinds of members. After defeating Anchi and his crew, saving your allies, and having Taiho talk to them, they'll finally join up with you. Recruiting the pirates into PlayStation Sukunen always felt lacking, so it's nice that they and a few other characters were given a bit more personality and things to do here. In Sukunen, AK is a wandering martial artist who values strength as the only truth, and will only join the roster when the hero has achieved a certain amount of strength, specifically when he reaches level 40 or higher. In the PlayStation version, that's pretty much where AK's role in the game ends, as he's a decent short-range fighter that most people probably won't add into their party more than once, if only to jack his double-beat rune to hand over to Victor. But in the Sega Saturn version, he is the bearer of a very special rune, the Beast Colosseum rune, which allows him to summon forth monsters from different worlds to combat on the roof of Toron Castle. In this new arena mode, you can select one character from your party to test his strength over 6 rounds, each consisting of several one-on-one -on -one matches with a variety of standard and boss enemies, all for the low entry fee of 5000 potch. Instant death attacks from runes such as the Soul Eater are ineffective, and challengers won't have their status restored between matches and rounds, though they are free to use items and other traditional spells. Winning a round gives the option to quit while you're ahead and claim your prize, but as the first few bouts are laughably easy and the rewards reflect that, you'll probably want to go on until at least the fifth trial, which will earn the champion a fresh set of windspun armor. However, going for the gold and overcoming the final round of monsters will grant the ultimate prize, one of two new items specifically added to this port. The one you'll receive is determined randomly, and the first is the darkness rune, which would also see its way to Suikoden too and is just a lower form of the Soul Eater, with one weaker spell available in place of Judgment. The second item you may receive is the Silver Spun Dragon Armor, the very best armor in the game with plus 70 defense and a 20 HP restoration bonus each round, another item that would be added to the sequel, although in slightly gimped form. The biggest addition to the Saturn port affecting Sukunen's storytelling comes in the form of a few brief, interactive cutscenes involving Gremio during the path to the game's true ending, which takes place right before the final battle against the Scarlet Moon Empire. As Legnaught uses her gate rune to bring back Gremio from the dead to be reunited with his beloved friends and young master Dole, you get to control him as he wanders the afterlife, chasing after the boy he dedicated his life to taking care of and reliving some key moments of Gremio's life before it was abruptly robbed from him at Sonia Prison. It doesn't last long, there are no memories included that the player isn't already familiar with, and upon completion of this segment, the game continues on just as it did in the PS1 version, but for a fan of Sukuren and the Gremio character especially, it's a really nice, touching, and welcome addition. Some of the weirder additions to the game include a kind of pet cat simulation, and brand new gambling minigames that replace the old ones for no good reason. Revisiting Lepont's hometown of Koan later in the game, you may hear the cries of an unseen kitten hidden away within some boxes in a random event that occurs there. You can bring the cat back to your castle, where it will take up residence in the protagonist's bedroom. From here you can interact with the cat in a few ways, feeding it to keep it full and healthy, playing with it to lift its spirits, and punching it to show the world how much of a bad person you are. There is a timer that I assume is related to the Saturn's internal clock, and hunger and energy levels will drop if you don't attend to the kitten for a while, or go overboard on feeding, playing, and punching. The little guy will level up as you take care of it, and I got it to level 99 somehow. The reason for doing so is a mystery to me, and as far as I can tell, it is there only to serve as a mildly amusing distraction from the main game. That or someone who worked on the port just really loved cats. The gambling games in the original Suikoden were classics. You had Marco's Cup game, one coin, three cups, and a big win if you can guess where that coin ends up after it gets shuffled around. Joel's played a card matching mini game that was pretty pointless, but was kind of fun nonetheless. And Taiho and Gaspar introduced players to Chinchiroge, which is basically the dice game Silo, a pastime that some would argue is the heart and soul of Suikoden. Well, they've all been scrapped completely, and now Marco plays a game where you must guess whether three spinning coins hidden in cups will end up as heads or tails. Joel's is a dealer in a blackjack variant, and Taiho and Gaspar toss dice into a bowl and you'll need to guess what range of values they'll add up to, with the less likely combinations rewarding greater multipliers. They're all lame, and now you have to win 5000 pots from each of the games to recruit their dealers. Also, in the original version, although Taiho says you need to bet all of your money to prove your luck to him in order to use his boat, 
he will actually only require a 1000 potch buy-in. In this version, he actually does take all of your money if you lose, so you'll probably find yourself much more frustrated getting past this part of the game in the port. Well, that's basically the gist of the Sega Saturn version of Konami's Gensou Suikoden. Though I left out a few minor or specific changes that are pretty much more or less what I talked about already, with this video you should have a pretty good idea of exactly what was changed from the initial PlayStation release. As far as which provides the superior experience between the two versions, I think it's pretty clear. The original all the way, especially if you'll be playing Suikoden for the first time. The extra content is nice in the Saturn game, but the constant barrage of load times, slower gameplay, and other smaller technical flaws and limitations do hinder enjoyment quite a bit compared to its Sony counterpart. If you're already familiar with the game, however, and especially if you're a big fan of the Suikoden series, I would definitely recommend giving this port a playthrough. It may be all in Japanese, but it's a simple enough game that anyone familiar with the original should be able to get through it with very little problem. Language barrier be damned. It's also such a short game for an RPG, so it doesn't need a huge time investment from start to end. Well, this is just the first part of my look at all the Japanese exclusive Suikoden 1 ports. Next up, I'll take a look at the PC version, released in the same year as the Saturn one, and then I'll top things off with the PSP edition from 2006. Are either of these ports superior to the PlayStation original? Hmm. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed the video and will take a look at what follows. And I also hope everyone's enjoying the summer of Suikoden as it begins to come to a close. As always, thank you for watching. This is Jimmy Hoppe. Take care.